The purpose of life support is to help others know how to come alongside those who are hurting and suffering. And hosted by Paul Johnson, Senior Pastor of Ridgewood Church in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Everything you do from then on is different. One of the detectives, I think his name was He was a golden boy. All we can do right now is come together. Extreme domestic violence, multiple rapes. Here on Life Support, we want to talk about trauma because we believe that Jesus is in trauma and he draws us closer to himself. And we do that through story. And here again this week to tell her story is Cindy Lannon, who has been sharing some very difficult things regarding her husband, Jerry, who took his own life not terribly long ago, police officer, uh, law enforcement officer, um, a a PTSD sufferer. And Cindy, I'm so glad you're back because uh, where we left off last time was you had just found out about this. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine, not only are you a wife, but you're a wife of a police officer who probably lives with, is my husband going to come home anyway? And you shared that you were taking guns out of the house and you were already on edge. It must have been a horrible moment. Yeah, it sounds so crazy to hear you saying all that. You know, when you're in the midst of it, it's it's your reality. But then the afterwards, it's like, oh, my gosh, that's so crazy. But, um, yeah, so when, when I found out that Jerry had taken his own life and my brother and the sergeant showed up at my house, well, it just felt like immediately our house started filling with people, which... I know it's interesting. Some people want to be alone and have space in those times. I I was so grateful that people started showing up at our house. But the, one of the very first people that showed up at my house, can I just back up a second? When I was on staff at our church for several years overseeing addiction recovery ministry, I actually volunteered as a chaplain for two different law enforcement agencies, my husband's the Washington County Deputy Sheriff's Office, and the Lionel Lakes Police Department. So I was a chaplain myself for, I think, seven years or so for both those departments. Mm -hmm. Had gone through pretty extensive training with the Minneapolis PD for that. But So ironically, one of the very first people to show up at my house, we were sitting in the living room, probably a half a dozen of us, and this car pulled up out front, and I saw this strange man that I didn't know get out of the car and start walking towards my house. But I'll never forget, he had a bright red Bible tucked under his arm. And I said to the sergeant, I said, who is that? And he said, oh, it's one of the chaplains with us now. He said, well, you know, we called the chaplain to come in. I said, no. I said, get him out of here. I don't want him in my house. And I think everybody thought I was a little crazy, but I said, I don't know that guy, and nobody's walking into my house with a little red Bible right now. That was the last thing I wanted. Oh, I was just, I may have even cursed about it. I was so upset about it. But um, so they walked out and told him to leave. Well, a friend of mine that I worked with at church previously, she was also a chaplain for the department, and I said, get Sue over here, just get Sue over here. So he left, and Sue ended up coming over. But I just thought, how crazy is that, that here I am, a woman of faith, a Christ follower, a Christian. I was a chaplain, and I'm telling them to get the chaplain out of here. I just I wanted no part of that right at the moment. It was because you didn't feel safe. <laughs> Yeah. You're vulnerable, and when you're in the midst of that, and I've been there, you're yeah. raw, and it feels like you know your whole insides are exposed. Yeah. And someone like that is not a help; they're a threat because you don't know them. It, it, yeah. it just it just reeks of kind of protocol. Yeah. And there's really nothing good about that. No, and even I'll say that my friend Sue, she's such a dear woman, but she, you know, so many people were at. I don't even know how many people were at my house that night. There had to be. 60 or 70 people there. It was just flooded with food and people, and it was wonderful. That made me feel great comfort. But also Sue, probably four or five times during the evening, came over to me, and she said, Cindy, 
can we gather for everybody to pray? Can we? And and I just kept blowing her off, mm-hmm. and and she probably was wondering why I was doing that. And she'd come up to me again. Can we just gather? And in hindsight, I I wish I would have just said to her, I want all of you to go stand in the gap for me right now. Go in the bedroom, circle however many people you want. Go in the bedroom, or go downstairs, or go somewhere and pray for me. I. I, go stand in the gap for me. I can't. I can't think about that right now. I just. I couldn't wrap my head around that. Oddly. Yeah. And th- this is a really good practical moment because when you're dealing with someone who is in trauma, don't just assume you know what they need. Don't push something on them. Yeah. Ask. Right. What can we do? Right. What do you need? Right. And if the person says, "I don't know," then say, "Okay, I'm here." Right. Yeah, you I, weren't ready for any of that stuff. I was you didn't want to see this uh, other chaplain. You weren't ready to have people stand over you and pray for no. you. That makes me my skin crawl even thinking oh, about it. Good, then I don't feel so bad. No, no, you come around me. We'll yeah. we'll, we'll be introverts together in that yeah. er, that regard. But you know, you loved having the people there, but not to move in and tell you how to be right. Right, uh, exactly. And we I, so often want to fix people like oh, that. Oh, and. You know, I mean, I sat at the kitchen table that night with people, friends of mine, dear friends that came over. And, I mean, we even had laughter that sure. night, which I thought, well, maybe people are wondering why I'm laughing when my husband just died. But I just, that's just the way I am made up, I guess. And I, yeah, so. Nothing wrong with that. It's uh, it's it's life and you're coping and you, yeah. you're with friends and. And I think that's such a great point is that, and something I've learned since then is that there's no right way and there's no wrong way to grieve in the moment or, you know, it's been about 15 or 16 months for me now. And so it's not a very long time. It's not a very long time. And I still, you know, there's just no right or wrong. And, and I tell my three daughters that too, you know, whatever we're feeling is fine we're we're okay and some of us have walked up the trail to the site where jerry died and some of us have not um i've gone back there probably a half a dozen times now and mostly by myself and mostly i'll just go up there and visit and i hung a cross up there and i'll say a few words and sometimes i just one time i've gone back there and just screamed and screamed and yelled and I don't know if anybody's been around, but <laughs> if they did, they think I'm That's a crazy okay. lady. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, but and some of my girls haven't gone back there yet. And but don't everybody's want to. moving differently through mm-hmm. this. So you were on a church staff, yes. and so you know the inner workings of church. Yes. And yeah. um, we're glad that congregants aren't always in the office mm-hmm. uh, to watch us navigate <laughs> that. Um, is church a safe place for trauma survivors? I think. Um, you know, in the beginning, I I wasn't on staff when Jerry died any longer on staff, but still have very many friends there, obviously, and some good friends and coworkers. But um, immediately, uh, gosh, they were very good, you know, very kind. Of course, some of them came over to my house that day. Um, but I think they just don't know what to do. It's just an uncomfortable thing. Even when I was on staff and people in recovery, you know, most people aren't very familiar with that. If you're not familiar with it, you haven't experienced it, it's an uncomfortable situation. And, you know, when I see them now, they're, of course, asking me how I'm doing and they're very kind. But as far as, like, follow-up? Um, not so great. Not so great. And I will tell you that... The, I mean, there's been a, there are people that have followed up, not from the church, but friends and family. But I will tell you that the one person that has been constant for the last 16 months is a gal that I worked with at the elementary school, who's an atheist. How about that? How about that? Mm-hmm. I I thought you were going to say the chaplain with the red <laughs> Bible. I feel no, sorry for him. He hasn't came back. He hasn't come around. <laughs> no, he hasn't come I around. I wonder why. Yeah. 
But that gal that I worked with who's atheist, she, she regularly sends me a card in the mail. And it might be a serious card and it might be a funny, hilarious card because her and I had a lot of humor together when we worked together. But she just tells me she's thinking of me um, and... Well, that's a God thing. Yeah. There's a relationship developing there. Right. We just got a note from one of our neighbors. We're still experiencing the fallout of losing our son, mm-hmm. and another son is really struggling with mm-hmm. mental health issues, and we had a really bad night, and we got a note from a neighbor across the street who we've been ministering to. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're praying for you guys. Oh. And I thought, what a what a great way to show that a relationship is being built yeah. because it's going both ways. Yeah. And so God is always at work. My experience in church, and I, uh, you know, I've had two major issues in my life. I lost yeah. uh, a wife to cancer. I lost my son and pastor both places, two different places. And I found it to be very intimidating because either people are being really pushy mm-hmm. and, and, and really think they know what's best for you, mm-hmm. or they see you coming and they sort of scatter. Scatter, yeah. And I, al- I always say the best thing, the best counsel I can give people is, you know, just walk by, maybe touch someone on the arm and walk away. Yep. Or say, hey, I'm with you yes. and walk away. Yeah. And if that person wants to pursue you, they will. Right. And you, you're so right. People don't know what to say, but let me just tell you right now, and I know many of you have friends that are going through trauma. You don't have to know what to say. What they want is your presence, not your words. Not your Bible scripture, not your Hallmark cards. They want you to just be be there with them, or praying for them, or knowing that you're with them. You can't. Nobody has the words that can take that away. No, absolutely not. But you're so right. I think about one of my friends that came over the night Jerry died, and she just moved around my kitchen all night. And then the day of Jerry's funeral, she was standing in the wings, and she would come over and hand me a bottle of water. She wouldn't say anything. She didn't yeah. say anything. But but that's her, precious, though. It's so precious. And yeah. when I think about Jerry's death and that, I think of her immediately. And she w- she didn't do anything magical. She was there. And that just, I mean, oh. And the last thing you need, and here's, what, here's the other thing that happens, is you end up being the comforter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because no one else knows what to right. do with this. They're right. grieving. You're sitting there going, they're not helping me. I want to help them. And right. then you're helping to explain to them how to move through your grief. Right, yeah. And that brings a lot of extra pressure and right. I, it can be very difficult. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I just think it's just a lesson for everybody in the church to know about is that there is there is nothing magical you can do. But to be there and just to... To follow up, to follow up, yeah, to just, check in, yeah. just to check yeah. in. And mm-hmm. the one question I hated right away after Jerry died was, how are you doing? Yeah. Because how am I supposed to answer that? You know, I just tell me, hey, I'm thinking about you. Or, That's right. I, you know, I was praying for you this morning or That's right. something of the sort. But I even catch myself asking people that in our <laughs> I church. Know. I go, Paul, you dummy, you know so much <laughs> I know. better. I know. Stop. Just, but many times I'll just shoot a text out. I'm with you, mm-hmm. praying for you, Yes. love you. Yes. I'll leave it at that. And if they want to get back, that's great. Yes. Sometimes I'll put on there, I'll say no reply necessary so mm-hmm. they know that there's no expectations. Right. Because the last thing I want to do is make them return emails that they don't want to or right. a text or something like that. Yeah. You also have this whole police officer side of yeah. this thing. Yeah. And um, talking with the detectives that worked our case, we got an insight into some of this, but you know it all too well. Mm-hmm. What can we do to help police officers yeah. get, I, bear up under the responsibilities that they have? It's Yeah. It's... A terribly difficult thing. It is a difficult job. They never get called to a birthday party, you know, unless somebody's drunk and causing a problem. But they don't get called to good good calls. It's all bad calls. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I just encourage people to, if you are out and about, you see a police officer, just thank them. I, I know Jerry would, you know, he, he would come home and tell me if he was in the gas station or at the restaurant or and somebody came up to him and talked to him and thanked him you know if you buy him a cup of coffee well, I'm, that i mean you don't have to but i mean that's huge to those guys there's so many 
So I don't think you're weird if you do that no, kind of thing. No, not at all. I I'm think. always afraid they're going to look at me and go like, <laughs> "What do you uh, do can, wrong? Can, yeah, can I have your license, please?" You know. Yeah, no, I think they're very grateful for that because so many people aren't grateful for police officers today, especially it seems like. So for them to know um, that people are grateful and thankful for what they're doing means a lot to them. Um, I've been able to go to the sheriff's office and do some trainings with them since Jerry's death for not only the deputies but the, the Washington County jail staff. And I'll tell you, one of the things that was so cool for me to do with the jail staff, I share our story, and they most of them knew Jerry, so talk a little bit about that. But um, then I got to tell them that when I was working at the church with the Addiction Recovery Ministry, I told them, I said, I know you guys have a thankless job. You're in these four walls doing circles all day long with all these bad guys and bad gals, but and you feel like you have a thankless job. But I'll tell you, when I was in the ministry and the people in recovery got to get up and get a medallion for some benchmark that they've reached in their recovery. Like we did that once one Thursday night a month that people could come up and receive that, their medallions. It never failed. Somebody would get up and say, when I was in jail, Mm. there was a jailer that talked to me about Jesus, or there was a jailer that told me he prayed for me. There was a jailer that was just kind to me and told me that they saw something in me that, you know, they knew I would be okay. Or there was a cop that arrested me, and now I'm so... So when I told those jailers that people would get up and be grateful for something that they did or said to them when they were imprisoned... Those jailers, the look on their face was just like, wow. They couldn't yeah, believe it. Yeah, that's so encouraging for so. them. And I know that you're also dealing with wives, and I want to talk about that just for a moment. But it does strike me as you talk about jailers and police officers and all of the, There's an army of Christians out there. Mm-hmm. God has called us all to do different things. Mm-hmm. There, You are in ministry. There is no magic. I'm in ministry. No. It, you're... You're the mechanic, you're the doctor, you're the jailer, you're in ministry. Mm -hmm. And you're making an impact for Christ wherever you are. And this is a perfect example. Who would, you know, a sheriff that brings prisoners into the courthouse and back. Not a glamorous job. No. Huge opportunity for ministry. It's funny you mentioned that because that was Jerry's last assignment, was working in the jail, and he would bring prisoners from the jail up to the courtrooms, and he would take advantage of when nobody else was around. He would take advantage of those opportunities, and he would tell me about it. And I distinctly remember one time a guy, you know, was a repeat offender, and when he was sitting on the bench waiting to go into the courtroom, he looked at Jerry and he said, Hey, I remember you. Last time I was here, you told me about Jesus. How about that? (laughs) You know, so, I mean, how great is that? You know, what an uh, Jerry took advantage of those opportunities. Good for him. What yes. about the wives of police officers? I mean, uh, what's what's being done to help them? You know, that's a great question, but that's a that's another thing I've been able to go to a few meetings at the sheriff's office and actually talk about that, discuss that and how the families are impacted when you are married to a law enforcement officer or you're a child of a law enforcement officer. Um there's there's some uniqueness there, and some of it's great and some of it's not so great. So I did talk to them also about um, maybe doing some quote-unquote trainings or um, for children, mm-hmm. families, you know, the families right. and the wives. I actually, when I was a chaplain at the Lionel Lakes P- Police Department, I actually... Um, got to take advantage of that and doing that with some of the wives there and I didn't know if the if the male officers would want their their wives to partake or not but they were thrilled and they said yes do it so uh, I would meet with the wives we would just go out to dinner or go out to coffee sometimes I would have an agenda a little bit baby agenda um, sometimes not sometimes we would just hang out and they would share stories and similarities and what they were dealing with, and it was impactful and helpful. Um, it seems to me that churches, if you're a, you know, if you're a regular churchgoer, if you 
if you're committed to your local church and you know you have a police officer or a family of a police officer in your church, organize something to pray for them. It doesn't have to be overt to them, but pray for them. Right. Tell them that you appreciate them. Yeah. And know that they're going through particular circumstances that you really don't have any idea what yeah. that's like. And I had one church um, out by us talk to me about doing sort of an event, an appreciation event for law enforcement officers in the area. But my suggestion was that if you do it once, don't just do it once. Yeah. Because that's not going to have the impact that it Then it comes could across be. as a one-off One, kind of yeah, a big. Right. So what would you, um, in, we have like two minutes left. Mm-hmm. What what have you learned about God since oh. this? It hasn't been very long. Right. And many times people will come to me and they'll say, well, you know, it's been a year and I should be. No, no, a year mm-hmm. is just starting. Yeah. What have you learned about God? Oh, I have, well, I think I, I already knew that he loved me, but I, I've just learned that he is just there every moment with me. He has not left my side. I mean, there have been moments of despair when I have just cried out to him and, God, why are you, why? Why me? Why Jerry? I mean, why couldn't you have healed Jerry's brain? And then Jerry and I could have had a ministry of going around yeah, speaking right, to cops right. and wives. And But, you know, um, the big f- thing for me is um, I don't know why. there. You know, and people that don't have a faith might say, like, well, why did God allow Jerry to take his own life? And... I always say, well, my short answer is, I have no idea. Yeah, that why question is nowheresville. Yeah. It's right. heartbreak hotel. It, right, cause. but, you know, I, I know ultimately yeah. God has a perfect plan. Yeah. And so now if God can use me somehow in his perfect plan, imperfect me <laughs> for his perfect plan, I'm able and willing if I know Jerry would not want anybody to suffer the way he suffered, if there's anything I can do to help one person not to have to suffer that way, I think Jerry would be grateful for that, and I would be grateful for that, and I can guarantee you that officer's family would be grateful yeah, for that. Well, you're so. already doing that. Cindy, thanks so much for spending time with us and, you. and sharing your story. Thank you for the opportunity. It's our pleasure. You know, she's so right. God is always with us. God has a plan and there's a tremendous future waiting for us as believers. And I think of Revelation 21.4, that verse that we sometimes only read at the darkest hours of life, but it's so precious. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And that's what's ahead for us as believers. But there's also hope in this life. God is is with us, and he does love you very much. You may be struggling right now. Let me give you a number to call. If you at all are contemplating suicide, the Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. Reach out. Talk to someone. Don't let those thoughts spin around in your brain. The enemy will do that to destroy you. So please do that. Thanks so much for spending time with us on Life Support. We're thankful for our partners, Faith Radio, Five Stone Media. By the way, you can watch a video version of this show on Five Stone Media's website at fivestonemedia.com. You can reach out to us at Ridgewood Church, where I'm the lead pastor, by just going online at myrwc.org slash life support. You can check me out on Twitter as well, at Pastor Paul J. So glad you've been with us. We'll see you next time on Life Support.